Well, good morning. As the kids make their way to the back, if you have your Bible, I we'll encourage you to open it up to Psalm 35. And for those of you who were able to keep up with our meandering through the holidays and, and bouncing around a little bit and know that Psalm 35 is the sermon or the psalm that we're going to be uh, talking about today, you'll notice that it is a very long psalm. And because I love you, I will read it. And we will skip our usual reading together this morning. Um, for the sake of allowing me the maximum amount of time to preach through this psalm, because it is a very uh, important psalm for all of us. It's, it's important for us to apply the lessons that it's that it's teaching, and, and it's kind of one of the reasons why I kind of pushed it off through the holidays, because in the holidays we're distracted with a lot of other things, and um, I really wanted us to think about this and chew on this, um, the, the content of Psalm 35, because it's, it's something that every single one of you will deal with if you haven't already dealt with it in your own life. And the reality is there are very few things, I mean, I, I can count on this hand, how many things in life cut deeper than the betrayal of someone we love? It's one of the hardest things you will ever deal with in your life. And whether that's an unfaithful spouse, abusive parents, rebellious children, disloyal friends, backstabbing coworkers, or even manipulative employers. Each of them can inflict life's most painful wounds on our spirits. And sadly, it's been my experience in, in sitting with so many people over the years and um, counseling with people. This is one of those things that a lot of people can never get over. It breaks my heart to sit down with somebody and for them to tell me about a betrayal that happened 20 years ago that's still affecting them every day of their life. They don't have close friends because, you know, one time 20 years ago, I had a close friend and that close friend stabbed me in the back. So that's why I don't have close friends. I don't get too close to people. I don't want to have close relationships with people. Well, you know, that really makes Christianity hard. Because Christianity is a community sport. It's not an individual sport. But because I've been hurt in the past, they say, I, I just I can't put myself out there again. I might get hurt again. Well, let me just go ahead and tell you. You're going to get hurt again. But David gives us six ways in this psalm to deal with that hurt biblically and appropriately. In Psalm 35, some of David's closest friends and allies have now become his fiercest enemies. The, the setting of this psalm is the pursuit of David by Saul and his armies and, and Saul's jealousy over the fact that David was to be king led him to want to murder David, and think about it for a second. David used to be the captain of the army. He used to be one of Saul's mightiest men, and he had a troop of people that he went around with in the army fighting on Saul's behalf. He was their leader, and now they're chasing after him to kill him. David had respected them. Now, I, I never had the privilege of serving in the military, but again, sitting and talking with so many people who have served in the military, they can attest to the fact that one of the things that battle does and one of the things that the military does is it instills a brotherhood. This person's got your back. You've got to completely trust them when you go into combat that they're going to protect you. 
And, and in many ways, men come out of the service, and women too for that matter, and they come out as brothers, right? There, there's this closeness there. Now, as time goes on, they may grow apart and go their own separate ways, but, but during that time of battle, especially during battle, a bond is forged there. A brotherhood, a trust that's sacred to many of them. And here we find David and that group of people that he's been in battle with. And now they've turned their back against him. And even worse, they're seeking to kill him. And Psalm 35 is a very emotional psalm. And if you don't like emotions, this is a hard psalm for you. Because David is just completely raw and pouring himself out to God in this psalm. And David, he, he gives us six lessons that I, I think will help us when, when people turn, the people that we love, turn against us. And I want to remind you, Christ taught us how to treat our enemies. But David taught that we can come to God with our raw emotions. And that we can trust and praise him even when our best friend our spouse, our family betrays us. So I want to give you those six things and then we'll kind of walk through because again, it is a bit of a long psalm. This is what to do when friends become our enemies. The first thing that David teaches us in verses one through three is to let God protect you and don't feel like you have to protect yourself. Let God protect you. Don't feel like you have to protect yourself. Then in verses 4 through 8, we're going to see the second thing, which is ask God to execute justice. Don't take justice into your own hands. Then 9 through 10, while you wait for God to exercise that justice and execute that justice that you're asking for, praise Him and His salvation. Fourth, in verses 11 through 16, tell God about the unjust hatred of your enemies, not everyone else around you. Tell God about the unjust hatred of your enemies, not everyone around you. Then in verses 17 through 26, focus on letting God, the judge, vindicate you instead of the court of public opinion. And then finally, in verses 27 through 28, celebrate God's deliverance and righteousness, not your own. And I'll remind you of those six as we walk through this. Starting in verses 1 through 3, David says this, Contend, O Lord, with those who contend with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Take hold of shield and buckler and rise for my help. Draw the spear and javelin against my pursuers. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. The first thing we see here, the first lesson that David teaches us is to let God protect us. Don't feel like we have to protect ourselves. Now, if we're honest, this is really hard. This is This is a a real struggle with David's first point of application for us this morning. Because one of the basic instincts that we all have is self-protection, right? We want to throw up the shield. We want to pull out the spear. We want to protect ourselves. Now imagine someone that you love, someone that you care about, someone that you trust is the one betraying you. How much more would you want to defend yourself? It takes discipline on our part. It takes maturity on our part to do what David is instructing us to do, which is to let God protect us rather than trying to protect ourselves. There's no stronger ally that we can have than God himself. The all-powerful creator of the universe should be the first person we turn to. And as a believer, nobody loves us more than God. 
Your wife doesn't love you more than God does. Your children don't love you more than God does. As a believer, God loves you more than anyone in the world. Because he made a covenant with us through the blood of his son. That's how serious he is about his love for you. Under fierce attack by faithful friends, unlike so many of us, David knew the place to turn. He called upon the Lord to defend him. And David's employing two metaphors here in these first three verses, kind of comparative images, if you will, to express the help that he needed from God on his behalf. First, in verse 1, he needs the Lord to defend him the way an attorney defends his client. David is passionately called upon God to contend or to be an advocate for him. To to step up, to establish his innocence and wrongdoing towards his his attackers. Now, most of us know this. If we know anything about the law, one of the stupidest things you can do is what? Represent yourself. You you want to retain someone who is a a third party who can stand there and without the emotion, without the, the, the feelings that you have, represent you and present the best case possible for you. And that's what David is asking here. He's like, hey, God, I I need you to be my attorney here. I need you to be the one making the case for me. Second, in verses 2 through 3, David is calling upon the Lord to fight as a mighty warrior battles for his king. In other words, the way David used to fight for Saul, he's asking the Lord, hey, fight for me. I need you to fight for me. And he, he does that by painting this vivid picture of a champion in full armor wielding his deadly weapons against the enemy. The shield and the buckler were defensive gear of warriors. The shield was a small kind of round protector. It was held close to the warrior for hand-to-hand combat. Okay, So you're in a sword fight. It's the small thing that you're throwing up to defend yourself. The the buckler is the large rectangular shield that you crouch behind when fired upon from some distance, right? So when the archers came out and they pull back their bow, you get behind that. And you normally had someone who carried that for you, an armor bearer that would carry that for you. And David is asking the Lord to be his armor bearer, to, to be the one to protect him. But not just protect him defensively, also offensively. Verse 3, David prayed that God to cast his spear and immediately stop his pursuers in their tracks. Fearful and deeply distressed, David begged God to then speak to his soul. See, David knew, man, I I need to hear the truth. There's a lot of lies out there, and I need to hear the truth. David anxiously needed a personal word from God to hear God say, I am your salvation, right? There at the end of verse 3, say to my soul that I am your salvation. Notice the, the connection between the images of the attorney and the warrior. By fighting against and destroying his enemies as a warrior, The Lord would vindicate David of the charges against him before all of Israel like an attorney. The application for this point of letting God protect us and not feeling like we have to protect ourselves is this. David's response to Saul's attack teaches us that there are times when we need to step back and let God fight our battles for us. Romans 12, 19 says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. When we're unjustly attacked, we we feel this compelling, unrelenting need to, to fight back and to defend ourselves. But we must prayerfully discern when God would have us do nothing in response and leave our vindication to him. 
1 Corinthians 4 or 5, Therefore do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring, the light, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. See, we, we, we want to defend ourselves. We, we are quick to defend ourselves. But we need to step back and let the Lord fight our battles for us when we are unjustly slandered and accused. When pursued by Saul, David refused to take matters into his own hands. I don't know if you know this story, but if you go back and you read 1 Samuel and you see Saul and his army pursuing David, David had two opportunities to kill Saul. Two easy opportunities to just take him out. But both times he chose to spare his life. Why? Because David didn't care? No, David cared very much, but David trusted God and he left Saul to God to judge. He didn't take matters into his own hands. When we know we've done nothing wrong, we can boldly call upon God to defend us the way David did. In God's perfect timing, Saul was destroyed, vindicating David in the sight of all of Israel. And God sometimes chooses to, vis to visibly judge our enemies, while at the same time he openly blesses us, like he did for David. And spiritual people will recognize this, and will be vindicated in their sight. doesn't mean everybody will like us. But those who are believers, those who, who have a mind to understand what God is doing, will understand. Hebrews 10.30 says, For we, we know him who said, It is mine to avenge, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. On the other hand, some matters won't be cleared up until God's day. At the final judgment, when, when the unsaved stand before God in judgment, he will present the case against them in detail, including their sins against you. You see that in Revelation 20, 11 through 12. If your accuser is a genuine believer, the Lord will set everything straight at the judgment seat of Christ. 1 Corinthians 4, 3 through 5 teaches us that. God promises that he will always do right. We can trust him to deal with our enemies and to vindicate us when we live righteously. So that's the first thing that David teaches us. Let God defend us. Don't try to defend ourselves. But that doesn't mean that we don't ask for justice. God is a God of justice. As believers, we are people of justice. And so the second thing that David teaches us in verses 4 through 8 is to ask God to execute justice. We just don't need to take that justice into our own hands. Verse 4, let them be put to shame and dishonor who seek after my life. Let them be turned back and disappointed who devise evil against me. Let them be like chaff before the wind with the angel of the Lord driving them away. Let their way be dark and slippery with the angel of the Lord pursuing them. For without cause they hid their net for me, without cause they dug a pit for my life. Let destruction come upon him when he does not know it, and let the net that he hid ensnare him, let him fall into it to his destruction. Saul's relentless pursuit of David was unjust and based on his own jealousy rather than the facts. At, at no time did David ever try to take the throne from Saul. David knew he would be the next king, but he didn't try to be the king today. But Saul's jealousy drove him to this place of the only option is either David is the king or I'm the king. That was the lie he started to believe. But nothing about David's character, nothing about what David had ever done up until that point None of the facts, none of, none of the reality pointed to a need to be jealous. 
And yet, Saul, driven by his jealousy rather than facts, sought to kill David. David asked God to execute perfect justice on Saul and his men. And it's interesting to see what David is asking for. Do to them what they're trying to do to me. Right? Do exactly what they're trying to do to me, to them. In verse 4, David prays, David's prayer is for God to judge his enemies. And, and, and this is the point in which you see the, the emotion of David coming out. Right? And, and in that emotion, is, 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 it's very harsh and it's very pointed. Saul had sought David's life. Therefore, he prayed for God to act in pure justice and without mercy toward them. He asked the Lord to do exactly what they were going to do to him. Saul had brought great shame upon David by spreading all of these lies, making false accus- accusations. He ended up having to flee like a criminal. He was on the run. And David prayed that Israel's unstable king in his mind, or excuse me, in his men, would be confounded and disgraced the same way David was now disgraced. That they would suffer the same shame that that David was suffering. And additionally, David asked that God prevent their efforts and drive them back, bringing further dismay and humiliation upon them. In verse 5, David called for the angel of the Lord to intercede to chase Saul and his men in the same fashion as they had unjustly pursued him. Now, the angel of the Lord is a very special messenger in the Old Testament. Some commentators believe that this is the Son of God in an earthly appearance before he came as Jesus. But regardless of that, God sent the angel of the Lord to protect and lead Israel promising that he would fight against their enemies if they obeyed him. In Exodus 23, 20 through 23, David vividly prayed for that special messenger, this special angel of the Lord, that he would forcefully drive away Saul and all of his soldiers, and and like the wind scatters the chaff, that he would just blow them away. He further prayed that the angel of the Lord would chase them down a dark and slippery path where where they would not see their way and they would fall helplessly before him in the pits that they had dug for David. The angel of the Lord is mentioned only twice in the book of Psalms. In this psalm, here, and in Psalm 34, 7, which we know was written during David's pursuit. Because you may be going, "How how do you know that this is about that time when he was being pursued by Psalm, or, or by Saul? Well, we we know that by this connection of the angel of the Lord and this reference back to Psalm 34, 7. Then in verse 7, David prayed without reservation for his enemies' destruction because they were seeking to destroy him without cause. He had done nothing wrong towards Saul. He was completely innocent, and yet in Saul's jealousy, he sought his life. Therefore, David prayed that Saul and his army would reap exactly what they had sown. David compared himself to a a, a bird who was being hunted or or an animal that was being pursued by Saul and his men. They stalked David by spreading a disguise net and digging hidden pits. And he asked God to serve poetic justice on them by allowing them to unknowingly fall into their own traps. David wanted them to reap what they had sown. The application of asking God to execute justice and not taking justice into our own hands is we need to remember this morning that God loves justice. And because we're made in the image of God, we also have a strong desire to see perfect justice done. We want justice served upon those who do wrong against us and those who do wrong against others. However, in any discussion of justice, we must remember that God has commanded us to leave vengeance to him. You see that in Romans 12, 19. 
When criminal acts are involved, God has delegated the responsibility of executing justice to civil authorities, right? We're, we're not a church that's going to cover up a crime because, oh, they're, well, they're a brother in Christ and we, we're, we're not going to execute justice. We'll let God take care of that. No, if, they, if, if you participate in a crime, we're going to get the police involved. And you know what? That brings glory to God because he's a God of justice. And we should be people of justice as well. But, but God has not given it to us to take the matters into our own hands and to execute justice ourselves, right? He's delegated that to civil authorities. He never gives us permission to avenge ourselves. Never. Now, certainly it is not wrong for us to pray for justice, to be exacted. Look, look at what David's praying for, <laughs> Right? They're pursuing me. They're trying to kill me. Lord, do the same thing to them that they're trying to do to me. Jesus, though, taught us to pray for our enemies, our persecutors, and to love and to bless them in Matthew 5, 44. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven, for he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. Paul admonished us to do the same, adding that we should never return evil for evil in Romans 12, 14 and 17. He says, bless those who persecute you, bless those, and do not curse them. Repay no one evil for evil, but give all thought to do what is honorable in the sight of, the, of all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, and I will repay, says the Lord. Jesus himself demonstrated this from the cross when he prayed for God to forgive those who crucified him. When stoned for preaching the gospel, Stephen followed Jesus' example in Acts 7. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he said this, he fell asleep. It's very difficult to pray for those who wrong us. It's even harder to do good to them. But when we discipline ourselves to obey Christ's commands, even when we do not want to, God will change our hearts toward our enemies. He will enable us to forgive them and to truly desire what is best for them. As we exercise Christ's spirit toward those who sin against us, we can rest assured that God will avenge us of the wrongs that they have committed against us. Ask God to execute justice. Don't take justice into your own hands. So what do we do instead? Well, that leads to David's third point in verses 9 through 10. Then my soul will rejoice in the Lord, exalting in his salvation. All my bones shall say, O Lord, who is like you, delivering the poor from him who is too strong for him, the poor and needy from him who robs him. In verse 9, we see that David waited and trusted the Lord to deliver him from Saul. He looked forward to the day when he would be praising the Lord for bringing justice on his enemies in verse 9. And he solemnly promised that he would give God all the glory for saving him. Going so far as to rehearse the chorus of praise that he would sing. In the beginning of verse 10, David is anticipating God's justice upon his enemies, and this leads David to rejoice in the uniqueness of the one true and living God. There's none like him, David reminds us. When David says, all my bones, he means everything I am. Saul intended to crush David, to totally destroy him. But David declared in faith that he would live on to give God now, I want you to pay close attention to what David is saying. David promised to exalt God for who he is. He promised to exalt God because of his righteous character. He didn't merely promise to praise God for what he would do for him. 
See, I think that's, that's where some of us get a little tripped up there, right? It's like, Lord, I want to praise you for when you kill them. I want to praise you for when you vindicate me. What's the focus there in that prayer? Me. But that's not David's focus. David's focus is there's none like you. You are, you are so different from me. You, your holiness is, is like nothing I have ever imagined or experienced. I'm going to praise you for your righteousness. I'm going to praise you for your justice and your time. Not just because I want you to do this for me. The second part of David's praise, he focuses on how the Lord delivers the poor and needy from their oppressors. And although you might be thinking, well, Dale, you just said David was a mighty warrior. He, well, he was, but compared to an army, right? He, he's just one guy. And he knew this, that the Lord is the champion of the poor. Those who are afflicted and the oppressed. This is one of the things I love about the Bible. From beginning to end, we see a God who, who is on the side of the poor and the oppressed. And David vowed to magnify the name of the Lord for coming to his assistance against a much stronger and oppressive army. I think we can learn from this this morning. That, that while you wait, we need to praise God and his salvation. When you find yourself in the midst of a trial, first question for you this morning, do you wait? Do you wait? If so, what do you find yourself doing while you wait? I'll be willing to bet for many of us, if we're honest, while being slandered and accused and hunted down by our enemies, many of us don't wait by praising the Lord in the midst of that. Right? We, we have a little trouble with that New Testament verse that says, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. It's like, well, but I'm in the middle of a temptation here. What? Why am I counting it all joy? Why am I praising? Instead, many of us fill that time. If we do wait, so if, in other words, if we don't go into self-defense mode and we do wait, most of us spend that time waiting filled with worry and anxiety about what's going to happen. I want to challenge you this morning. How much better would your life be if instead of worrying and being anxious, you remember that we serve a God who is greater than our circumstances? That we can be like Job even in the face of some unfathomable losses. We can resist the temptation to curse or blame God and instead choose to trust Him and bless His name. God's name represents all that he is. His character, his attributes, his mighty works. There is none like the Lord. When everything in our life seems to be at its worst, we can rest, we can wait and rest in the assurance that God is always at his best. God never has an off day. He never has a bad day. We do. Lord knows I do. But he doesn't. And we can praise him for that. We can praise him for who he is despite our circumstances. As it says in Psalms thirty-three twenty-one, for our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. So we need to wait and praise the Lord while we wait. The fourth thing that David teaches us in verses 11 through 16. Malicious witnesses rise up. They ask, of, they ask me of things that I do not know. They repay me evil for good. My soul is bereft. 
But I, when they were sick, I I wore sackcloth and afflicted, afflicted myself with fasting. I prayed with head bowed on my chest. I went about as though I grieved for my friend or my brother, as one who laments his mother. I bowed down in mourning. But at my stumbling, they rejoiced and gathered against me. Wretches whom I did not know tore at me without ceasing like profane mockers at a feast. They gnash at me with their teeth. Again, David here is, is back to that emotions. And, 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 and I want you to see here this struggle that's going on in David's heart. The, the David is really wrestling with what's going on, and he's really just pouring out his heart to God as, as he's reminded of things. He, he's just letting it all go. He's just letting God just hear it all. And here he's really feeling the sting of his friend's betrayal. And, and, and David knows that God wants and desires to hear exactly how he's feeling. The men who now sought his life were the same men whom he had served as the captain in Saul's Saul's army. These guys were his friends. They were like brothers forged in the heat of battle that he trusted with his life. And like a witness in the courtroom, David proclaims his innocence toward these guys, testifying here of all the good he did for them, that the evil charges that they were making against him were completely made up and false. First in verse 11, David's friends lied and made all sorts of false accusations against him. He pleaded his case before the Lord and passionately, as he declared his innocence before his accusers, he knew absolutely nothing about the crimes that he was charged with. Second, in in verse 12, we see David claiming that they are repaying him evil for good. David had not only done nothing against these men, But David had done good for them. David had come to them in their time of need. But they responded to his kindness with the vilest of evil. They sought to murder him for crimes that he didn't commit. And this vicious betrayal wounded David's soul. The word there that's translated in the uh, ESV is bereft. It's a word used in the Old Testament for the most excruciating grief imaginable. Do you know what that is? That's a parent losing a child. In the Old Testament, that's one of the worst, most painful experiences of grief that one can ever feel. And and David's using that word of this situation. He's applying that to himself right now, saying, I am feeling the grief as though I had lost a child. Then in verses 13 through 14, David says that they ignore all the good that he had done for them in the past. Now listen, this this right here, I'm not going to lie to you. In all my years of ministry, this is one of the things that, that hurts the worst. I understand why David uses the word bereft right before this. Because you spend time after time after time serving people, pouring into people, investing in people, giving them all that you have. And then they betray you. And somehow they managed to twist all that good that you did for them as some form of manipulation and count it as evil. And that hurts. Some of you know that because of past relationships. You sacrificed so many times for this person, and yet somehow that was twisted around as being manipulative. Or you only did it because you were trying to get something that you wanted. And David is feeling the weight of that right now. He's recalling all of those times as he's pouring his heart out to God. He's remembering all of the times that he had prayed for them. That he had served them. Again, the context here of of being in battle. These guys were probably injured. And David's praying that, that God would save them, would bring them back to life. 
Even fasting on their behalf and wearing sackcloth, a symbol of humility and urgency and grief. David genuinely cared about these guys. And when his prayers went unanswered and his friends continued to suffer, David mourned for them as if they were his mother. See, it's, it's different when somebody says, hey, would you pray for me? And when your mom says, would you pray for me? And, and that's okay. Don't, don't be upset about that. That's just a reality in life. But David here is saying, I was praying for them like it was my own mom, like it was my own dad. That, that's, that's the energy I was putting into the prayer for them. He was praying for their recovery and grief as he would for his own mom. As if his mom's life was hanging in the balance. That's how hard he prayed. And finally, in verses 15 through 16, David provides that they are unreliable friends. When David stumbled into adversity, these ungrateful friends failed to return to, the, to, to, to him the tender care that he had shown to them. These accusations get made, and rather than giving David the benefit of the doubt, rather than thinking about, man, are you sure this David, the one that cared for us, the one that loved us, the one that did all of these things? And instead, just assume the worst. Turn against him and rejoice in the trouble that he faced in verse 15. The adversity into which David had fallen it's just Saul's change of heart toward him. He did nothing wrong. And these fellow warriors were conspiring together behind David's back, literally tearing him apart with their continuous slander. Furthermore, they amused themselves at David's expense. In verse 16, the mockers to whom David referred were jesters hired to entertain guests at a banquet, usually by poking fun at others. And David here is probably comparing his former friends to these comedians, describing how they made fun of him during their meals. This, this idea of gnashing their teeth usually refers to people grinding their teeth together in, in rage or extreme pain. But in the context here, it's more likely that David may be stating that his disloyal friends just chewed him up and spit him out just like dinner. That, that's how they were treating him. So how do we how do we apply this? How do how do, how do we help? How does how does this principle of, of telling God about the unjust hatred of our enemies and not our friends? How, how do we apply that? Well, again, let me ask you some questions. When you are betrayed, or when you feel betrayed, who do you tell about it? Do you turn to God in prayer like David did? Or do you turn to your cell phone and text that friend that you know will share in your outrage with you and say, oh, you are so right and they are so wrong. Or, this is, this is a very recent thing, do you just make a passive-aggressive post on Facebook without naming the person, but yet clearly making it known that you are unhappy with them leaving it just vague enough that everybody that reads it goes what did i do did i do something <laughs> which then will lead because of the passive aggressive nature the people that are your friends to reach out to you and support you in your cause sometimes the first people to turn against us are those that we've helped the most. The question is, who will you turn to when that happens? And again, as your friend and as your pastor who loves you, it is going to happen. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Because we're all sinners. Redeemed, saved by Christ, praise God, but still sinners. Who will you turn to when that happens? Now, one side note. 
It's totally free. You don't have to pay for this one. I always get asked this. Does this mean that I should never tell anyone but God? And it, let, me, let me give you kind of a, a rule of thumb to help you with that. I want you to ask yourself the question before you tell another person. Ask yourself this question. Can the person I'm telling help the situation? Can the person I'm telling help the situation? If the person cannot help make the situation better, then it's just gossip. So, can the person help? And I get asked that question a lot because people come to me and they ask me for help. <laughs> Well, to ask me for help, they got to explain the situation. And they go, but I don't want to gossip. And I'm like, but I can help. Hopefully, if you're going to your small group leader, they can help, right? You're seeking out the counsel of someone who's not just going to take your side and go, oh, you're so right and they're so wrong. But it's a person that's going to help you go, well, how did you sin in this situation? Because there was two sinners involved. Chances are there's sin on both sides. Right? Go to people who can help. If you're going to people who can't help the situation, then that falls into gossip. All right. Tell God about the unjust hatred of your enemies, not all your friends. Five. Focus on letting God, the judge, vindicate you instead of the court of public opinion. We see this in verses 17 through 26. How long, O Lord, will you look on? Rescue me from their destruction, my precious life from the lions. I will thank you in the great congregation, in the mighty throng, I will praise you. Let not those rejoice over me who are wrongfully wrongfully my foes, and let not those who wink the eye, who hate me without cause, for they do not speak peace. But against those who are quiet in the land... They devise words of deceit. They open wide their mouths against me, and they say, Aha, our eyes have seen it. You have seen, O Lord, be not silent. O Lord, be not far from me. Awake and rouse yourself for my vindication, for my cause, my God and my Lord. Vindicate me, O Lord, my God, according to your righteousness, and let them not rejoice over me. Let them not say in their hearts, Aha, our hearts desire. Let them not say, We have swallowed him up. Let them be put to shame and disappointed altogether who rejoice at my calamity. Let them be clothed with shame and dishonor who magnify themselves against me. In these final verses, David, we see David's frustration rise again as he discusses the the treachery that he feels by these people who are falsely accusing him. And he finally, he bursts out with an impassioned cry to God to do something. He's asking God to judge and vindicate him. He's uncertain that he can bear much more. He, he, he urgently is asking God, like, how much longer? I, I just can't take this anymore. I need you to act. See, David, David cared about the court of public opinion, but not in the same way that we often do. You and I normally are more concerned about what the world thinks of us. I want you to notice some of David's concerns in this section. First, God's inaction gave the impression that he cared little about the injustice being done to his servant in verse 17. Second, David's rescue from Saul would result in God's glory being celebrated before the assembly of Israel in verse 18. Third, Saul's supporters were causing division throughout Israel. Verse 20. Unity is a big theme. I don't know if you've noticed that about the Bible, especially in the New Testament, but unity is kind of a big deal. David cared about the fact that division was happening amongst God's people. Fourth, the Lord's silence made David feel that God was far from him. Verse 23. After listing these reasons, David appeals to God's righteous character in verse 24. 
absolutely certain that he had done nothing to provoke Saul, David insisted that God vindicate him. That is, he wanted God to evaluate all the evidence he had presented and declare him innocent by stopping Saul and his men. From David's perspective, it would be unrighteous for his enemies to prevail. Therefore, God, in his uncompromised righteousness, needed to intervene, lest it make God look unrighteous. See, he cared about the court of public opinion, but not about himself. He cared about what Israel thought of their God. He again prayed for the poetic justice that that they would be clothed in the same shame and disgrace that had been thrust upon him in verse 26. David longed for the Lord to prevent them from overcoming him and celebrating his defeat. I think we can take from that that when our frustrations peak and we can't bear our burdens any longer, that we feel free to cry out to God and to cast our care upon Him. So many people I hear, they tell me this. They say, I ask them, I say, well, have you told God about that? God knows everything. Yeah, I know. But He also wants to have a relationship with you. And last time I checked, it's hard to have a relationship with somebody you don't talk to. It's hard to have a relationship, a deep, intimate, real relationship with someone you don't tell how you feel. Yes, he knows everything. He's omniscient. I get that. Thank you, Mr. Theology. He wants a relationship with you. He wants you to talk to him. He wants you to cry. He wants you to bring your pain, your suffering to him. When we find our our frustration has gotten to the point that we think we can no longer take it, don't be afraid to bring that to the Lord. Because listen, through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have open access to the throne. There used to be all these rules that we had to follow that if we didn't follow them could lead to some serious harm. And yet, because of what Jesus Christ has done, that veil got ripped in half. That thing that used to separate us from him, it ain't there anymore. Not because anything you did. Don't get too proud. David could speak boldly to God. We can speak boldly to God. He invites us to approach him boldly. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16, "Since, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has in every respect been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. There used to be all these rules. We needed those rules because we were imperfect sinners. But God sent the perfect priest to fulfill the ultimate sacrifice to enable you free access to the throne of grace. Man, that's, that should make you shout this morning. Thank you. One of the greatest lessons I hope you have learned so far from the Psalms is that we have the liberty to empty our hearts before the Lord and we don't have to worry about getting it right and saying the right words and doing this. and Just pour out your heart to God. While we should always approach God humbly, we should also approach Him honestly and frankly and as He invites us to, boldly. At the right hand of the Father is a man, the Lord Jesus Christ, who understands everything that we are feeling. He doesn't just sympathize. He can empathize. Because he came incarnate to experience all that we have experienced. Again, if you were shouting people, you should shout. 
Because he's interceding for us constantly. 1 Timothy 2, 5, For there is one God, there is one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ. I don't have to be the mediator. I don't have to go to a mediator. I got a mediator and it's Jesus and he's perfect and he's done everything, checked all the boxes, filled in all the blanks, done everything I couldn't do. Moreover, not, that, sh that would be enough. But listen, moreover, the Holy Spirit lives within us now. When we don't even know how to pray as we should, the Bible says he intercedes for us according to his will in Romans 8. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is in the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. God loves us more than we can even begin to comprehend. And as our heavenly father, his shoulders are broad enough to bear our burdens. He longs for us to turn to him with our problems and to fully trust him with all of our needs. First Peter 5, 7, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. When we do this, it helps us to do the last thing we see David teaching us to do in this psalm. And that's to celebrate God's deliverance. Verses 27 through 28. Let those who delight in my righteousness shout for joy and be glad and say evermore, great is the Lord who delights in the welfare of his servant. Then my tongue shall tell of your righteousness and of your praise all day long. After pleading his case to the Lord, after emptying out his troubled hearts and, 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 and all of his emotions that were just wrestling inside of him, David rested his heart in God's faithful hands. He had emptied his soul at God's holy throne, and as a result, the inexplainable peace of God swept over him. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you have gotten to that point where you've tried to stop doing it yourself. You tried to stop defending yourself, and all you could do was turn to him. And after pouring your heart out, you walk away feeling a sense of peace that you never imagined possible. The circumstances hadn't changed. The pursuers were still there. The lies were still there. The accusations were still there. But there was a peace in your heart that wasn't there before. Confident in the faithfulness of God, David celebrated in advance the victory God would give. It also led David to pray, not just for himself, but for God's people in verse 27. Even though Psalm or Saul and his followers had influenced many in Israel to turn against David, he knew that many others saw through Saul's je jealousy and stood with him. As David concluded his prayer, he, he thought not only of himself, but also of his loyal supporters. He prayed that God would give them reason to shout for joy and be glad. Additionally, David prayed that their rejoicing would flow from pure hearts. This is important. I want to slow down just a second. It's important because he didn't want them gloating over their enemies. He didn't want them gloating over Saul's defeat. He wanted them to exalt and magnify the Lord for granting peace to his servants. Celebrating God's deliverance also led David to tell of God's righteousness and praise all day long. David pledged to join his supporters in testifying of God's faithfulness by praising him continuously. Wrapping up. I want to end with two of the most important lessons we can get from Psalm 35. First, we should have faith that God will always be true to his character. He will always be true to his character. And like David, when we believe that God will be faithful to himself and his purposes, we can praise him for deliverance that has not yet come. Now, this doesn't mean that we'll never suffer. Nor does it mean that evildoers will never prevail against us. 
The Bible is very clear, 1 Peter 4, 12 through 13. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's suffering, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Again, that was 1 Peter 4, 12 through 13. God's own son was crucified. That should tell us something, right? But in the end, Christ was triumphant. And God gave him an even greater glory than he had known before. We may suffer at the hands of others, but the victory of evildoers is never final. In eternity, God's justice will be served upon the wicked because God will always be true to his character. And finally, we must always glorify God and never take credit for the marvelous things that he does. So that as it's written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. 1 Corinthians one thirty one. Also, we should never gloat nor take pleasure when justice is served upon evildoers. Proverbs 24, 17, do not rejoice or gloat when your enemy falls, and let not your heart be glad when he stumbles. Ezekiel thirty three eleven. say to them, as I live, declares the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? Rather, we should rejoice in the fact that God is just and that he acted according to his perfect righteousness. This morning, I know many of you have experienced the betrayal of someone that you love. And maybe because of that betrayal this morning, it's kept you from having relationships. You, you kind of keep everybody at a distance. I want to encourage you this morning to confess and repent of that. That, that self-protection and instead ask God to protect you. And you know what? That doesn't mean you're never going to get hurt. But the rewards far outweigh the risks. And God calls us to be a church. He calls us to be unified. He calls us to fight against division. And that's, that's hard to do when we're all at an arm's distance. Can't get too close. Can't trust you. Can't... I get it, you've been hurt. David gets it. But David also gives you things to do to help you get over that hurt. And it's my hope and prayer as you go into 2022, you make this a priority in your life. That if this psalm is about you, or as they say, if this song is about you, that you will apply the truths of God's word like a balm to your heart, like a good medicine to help you to heal what may be a month-old wound, a year-old wound, decades-old wound, and allow you to move forward in your relationships, not only with God, but with others. Let's pray. Father, thank you for being honest with us. Thank you for allowing us to see David's heart as he poured it out here in this psalm and, and, and allowing us and giving us the freedom to do the same. You, you recorded it in your holy Bible. That makes it important. So, Father, I pray that you would help us this morning be able to just pour out our hearts to you with whatever the betrayal was or maybe is if it's ongoing, and to trust you, to praise you for who you are, and to trust that you will always be true to your character. And no matter what happens in this life, in the end, ultimately, all things will be made right. We praise you for that this morning. And Father, I pray if there's anyone here that 
that doesn't know you. And, and maybe they don't know you because they were betrayed by someone that they used to go to church with. And that planted a seed of doubt in their heart of, I don't know if I can trust this God. I don't know if I can trust his people. Lord, I pray this morning they would at least begin to apply these, these lessons that David teaches us to their heart. And Lord, they would ultimately turn to you. But then also turn to your people and forge lasting, God-honoring relationships with them. 